Kimmy, can we just ask you if we have your permission to use this interview with you for Newslines Radio? Yes. Thanks very much, Kimmy. Okay. Um, okay. Let me see. Okay, um, Kimmy, firstly, can I just ask you um, briefly, you discussed your story um, in there in front of a large group of people. Can you maybe um, tell me, in, in, I know it's, it's hard to summarise, but um, just essentially what your experience was, um, you know, as a young person growing up, how you saw your, you know, your, your mother's experience and your experience and, and how you've brought that full circle, I guess, to, um, to do the work that you're doing now? I grew up in a, um, a very violent childhood. Um, my father was very violent. My mother never drank. Um, I was at sexually abused when I was younger, and I was a mother at 17. Um, my first marriage was violent. I had children for that ma- in that marriage. My second marriage was violent, much more violent. Um, and I just thought that after living through that, I had a lot of experiences that I could probably help others who may be going through the same thing. Um, and so the work that you're doing now, um, can you tell us a bit about that, how you've come full circle from, from what you've experienced and now you're, you're giving back and helping others, I guess? Um, I work for an organisation called Enough is Enough Anti-Violence Movement and it was first set up by Ken Marsley, whose son was shot in a botched pizza hut robbery and he um, developed this organisation and because he believed there was a better way um, to stop violence than just locking people away. Um, so I work there as a cultural coordinator. I do my own programs, but also the, the Enough is Enough programs in schools, juvenile centres and community groups. And, um, yeah, I thrive on helping others, so that's what keeps me going. Um, do you particularly work with Indigenous communities and victims of um, indes- uh, domestic violence in Indigenous communities? Um, not exactly. In, in, in all cultures I work with, as in Sydney now is pretty multicultural, so I work with the juveniles in, in the centres and in the schools. But um, after I present, there's always a couple of kids that will come up to me and ask me for advice. Maybe their parents might be violent or they might be in violent relationships themselves. So, um, yeah, I try to um, encourage them to build themselves up and um, that they deserve, deserve better in life, not to put up with second best. Can you maybe tell me um, why breaking the cycle of violence um, for Indigenous people, why is that such an important, um, an important way for um, women to overcome um, th- what's happened to them through domestic violence? Um, I think what is, I believe is that a lot of young people are growing up nowadays and believing that it's okay and they just accept that violence is an everyday part of their life and I just want to show others that, and tell others that there is a better life out there and um, in, especially in the Aboriginal community um, I believe we need to work with men as well as women because we have a high number of men that are in jail for a lot of these um, domestic violence situations and to do that we need to work with men as well as women. If you only work with one party, it's not going to solve anything. It's just going to cause more victims. And what do you, do you see in the work that you do? Um, how, how, how does it feel for you, I guess, when you see um, people that get through, get through this, both women and men, and, and the changes that you see, you know, going after what you've been through? How does, it, how does it feel for you when you're able to help people in this way and see those changes um, come about for them as well? Well, this work is very rewarding. It's not the money. I don't do this for the money. I do it for the rewards of helping others. Um, with the domestic violence program, I've had a lot of wins with um, especially males. Um, some of them are brought to tears and they didn't realise the impact that the violence was having on their kids. And to have a... a like, I've had a man that just broke down in tears and decided to go back to his home country of New Zealand where he lost all contact with his family and stuff. So it's good to... Um, have wins like that and I've, it really amazed me at first because a lot of the people that I do programs with um, are in the lower socio-economic stage of their life but I've had women from the North Shore come to me you know that are very um, well educated and they've been living in violence for four, three or four years you know and they've come to me looking for help to get out of it so it's a very broad um, thing that's happening in our community and it's just um, we need to stop it now. 
Can you tell me what was important, um, you know, for you personally in, in breaking that pattern and, um, you know, moving on and um, helping your family um, when when this happened to you? Um, that's a really hard one because um, you can't really force women to get out of their domestic violence. It's like a spark that ignites inside you that you've had enough. Like, I hit rock bottom, I was on heroin and everything and um, there was two ways I could have gone. I could have kept going downhill or I could have made a change. And that's what I say to people, it's, it's a hard road to choose to make it better, but at the long run, it's, it's what you have to do. And I, I, I didn't want to see my mum go through all that for nothing. You know, I wanted to get it out there and that make a difference. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you too, you mentioned in your talk um, the value of counselling. Um, how, how, what would you say the value of counselling brings um, for victims of domestic violence and the perpetrators of domestic violence? Well, when I do my talks, I, I always elaborate on counselling and say that um, you're not mad if you're going to go to counselling. People say it doesn't work, it's only talking to someone, but I, re- I believe that counselling was a big saviour for me because I could talk about anything. Um, I could get it all off. Um, we talk about men who bottle things up as well, who don't talk about things, and we've got to stop doing that. You know, you've got to talk about things. If you bottle up, you bottle up, and you'll finally explode. So um, there's nothing so bad that you can't talk to someone about it, whether it's a counsellor, a teacher, a friend, you know, anyone, but there's got to be someone you can talk to. Yeah. And I think, too, you'd um, had that little slide at the end where it had you talked about revenge well you didn't talk about it but it was uh, it was a positive take on it I guess um in the scheme of things um how big a thing is it or appropriate or not I suppose for um the men who are perpetrators of domestic violence um to be held accountable and 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 to be to, to be charged I suppose what is that um does that help towards I guess sorry breaking that breaking that pattern of um of 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 violence mm. They need to be held accountable and they need to take responsibility for their actions. But in saying that, there need to be appropriate programs for these men to change. Otherwise, they're going to create more victims. Um, so it's, it's an ongoing cycle. So they do have to take responsibility and that's part of their healing, to take responsibility and be accountable for their actions and then to make change changes so it doesn't happen again. Given your personal experience and the work that you're doing now, um, what... Um, what do you think the differences are um, with domestic violence in, in the Indigenous community as compared to the non-Indigenous community? I mean, what are the key issues that are of concern for Indigenous communities in particular? Well, um, I've noticed the publicity of Indigenous domestic violence, which is a negative on, on us as a people. Um, like Sutherland is a very well-to-do area where I live now and they've got one of the highest rates, but it's all kept indoors, whereas... Like, like me, when I was getting abused, I showed everyone what was happening to me now. I didn't keep it behind closed doors, and it seems that the bad publicity that um, Aboriginal people get, anything negative, is already blown up in the media. So um, it's very prevalent, and that's why there's a high number of incarceration, but it's, there's a lot of things that... There's um, poor education in our people, um, unemployment and drug and alcohol. And they're the key areas. And if our kids keep dropping out of school at year six as, well, as they are now, um, it doesn't show us much hope for the future. So I think a key to it is education. We've got to get our kids educated, otherwise they're going to fall into the unemployment and the drug and alcohol. So, and I think one of the things that did come up in that was um, the issue of um, drug and alcohol, um, drug abuse and alcohol abuse and how that contributes to domestic violence. Um, have you got anything to say about the connection between drug and alcohol abuse and domestic violence? Um, drug and alcohol has a um, big influence on domestic violence, um, both the perpetrators and the victims. Like I, I use drug and alcohol to escape. But I didn't escape, I just put everything on hold. So at the end of the day I had the abuse, but on top of it I had a drug and alcohol problem. Um, With the the perpetrators, sometimes, yeah, it is domestic violence, but a lot of occasions too it's hidden um, trauma that they're going through as well um, and taking it out on somebody. So drug and alcohol is a big contributor. Most of our people that have done domestic violence have a drug and alcohol problem, but usually they've created that drug and alcohol problem because they're trying to deal with something that they're going through and trying to solve it through drug and alcohol. 
And um, I guess what do you say that the pattern of, and I think that was raised in there, um, Aboriginal women who, um, you know, end up in jail based on, you know, defending themselves and their children and retaliating um, and the effect that that has on families as a whole and then the kids as well. So, you know, the mother ends up in jail, the father may end up in jail, you know, the effect on kids. Yeah, it's a total breakdown of the community, of the family, you know, and, and that's where all these troubles comes from, you know. It, our families aren't staying together, multiple relationships, the alcohol and drug abuse, um, incarceration is a big one because a lot of our people are incarcerated and that has a big effect. Um, and with domestic violence, a lot of our women aren't reporting domestic violence because they know that their kids will be removed through docs and that's a big, a big thing happening now. Um, given your experience, I guess, what advice do you have um, for other women who are experiencing domestic violence? Um, there is a way out. You can get out. Um, it may take you time, but you will get out. You've got to build yourself up, um, stay strong, and don't put up with second best. Go for the best. Don't put up with the relationship you've got. If, it's not, if he's not treating you well, well, you don't deserve to be in that relationship. And I guess just finally, you're the living example that, that this, can, this can happen, yeah. Yes, um, it took me a lot of years, but I've got through it um, and I'm happy doing what I am now, so, yeah. That's great. Thanks for your time, Kimmy. Thanks. Cheers.